So our last speaker is Daniel Strauss from Princeton University, and his field was in theoretical neuroscience. And his advisor is William Bialik. Did I say that right? Bialik. Bialik. He did his practicum at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Daniel. So it's probably fair to call me a machine learning person by now. Um, as many people who set out to do theoretical neuroscience end up. Um, so I'm DJ Strauss from Princeton. I'm going to be talking to you about some work I've done with David Schwab, who was a postdoc at Princeton. That's how I met him. But now he's a professor of physics at Northwestern. The problem we've been working on is known as the information bottleneck problem. So in this setting, we have some input data x, and we wish to extract the relevant information t that it has about some other variable of interest y. To do so, we have access to the joint distribution of x and y, so some statistical information about the relationship between x and y. And we seek a um, possibly stochastic mapping from x to t. Um, so throughout, I'll be using p for distributions that are fixed and given, q for ones that um, we can choose through some optimization. So from a statistics point of view, you can think about this as generalizing the notion of a sufficient statistic to a soft sufficient statistic. So t is a soft sufficient statistic um, for estimating y. From an information theory point of view, you can think about this as a lossy compression problem, where we want to compress x into t in a way that selectively maintains information about y. So here, it's like our distortion measure is like some measure of relevance between x, uh, of, of relevance of the information about y. Finally, from a machine learning point of view, you can think about this as a clustering algorithm. T will generally be of smaller cardinality than x. So we're clustering the data x into cluster identities t, where those cluster identities are maximally informative about some other variable of interest. So this is all uh, fairly abstract. I can talk about some concrete examples of tasks that can be massaged into this framework. So one of them, I only mentioned two here, but one of them are sort of goal-oriented clustering tasks where we have some um, unsupervised learning of clusters followed by some supervised prediction of a signal based on those clusters afterwards. So one such example is user segmentation. This is a, um, a task that many companies and websites do where they cluster users based on demographic information and past behavior, and they want those cluster identities to be as informative as possible about future behavior, such as ad clicking or purchasing. The second task I'll talk about is human attention and memory. So the brain is faced with um, a huge amount of raw sensory input and needs to compress that down to some lower dimensional neural activity or changes in synapses and connections between neurons. And this necessarily involves throwing some information away. Um, and so what's the criteria that the brain uses to decide what information to keep and what to throw away? Well, we definitely don't know that yet. That's, that's um, beyond the reach of uh, neuroscience right now. But a reasonable hypothesis might be information about future sensory input. So the, maybe the brain is selectively um, uh, retaining predictive information. And that's a, um, that's a hypothesis explored via the information bottleneck by a, a group in a PNAS paper this last year. I'll do, I'm going to go through some formalism. I'm gonna, there's going to be equations, but I'll, I'll talk through them. It shouldn't be too scary. Um, so the, the information bottleneck phrases the task at hand as an information theoretic optimization problem. So remember, we're given the joint distribution of x and y, and we're seeking the mapping from x to t. This is the encoder, the clustering, however you want to think about it, the, the compression. The cost functional has two terms. This first one is meant to encourage compression by minimizing the information that, our, um, that uh, t retains about x. And the second one is meant to maximize um, is, is like our measure of relevance, it maximizes information that t has about y. So um, then we have this trade-off parameter beta. So this just measures the relative preference for compression and relevance. Small beta encourages maximum compression, throw everything away. Large beta encourages maximum relevance, so don't worry about compression, just keep everything, keep all the information about y. Um, there's also a Markov constraint, which basically just enforces that after training on the joint distribution of x and y, uh, in our test set, we're sort of receiving examples of x, and we need to be able to predict information about y without looking, um, without knowing y. We're only looking at t. So this problem can be uh, solved using a typical variational calculus approach. Take the derivative, set it to zero. Um, when you do that, you get three equations. Um, 
the, in which you iterate to convergence from some initialization. Now the second and third equation, they're not very interesting. They're, uh, you can ignore them. They're just basically enforcing the rules of probability, like Bayes' rule and the Markov constraint as well. Um, the only real meat in this is the, this first equation here for the encoder. So uh, we can understand this by thinking about the clustering approach. So the conditional uh, probability of t given x asks, with which probability will we map data point x to cluster t? And to answer that question, we, ask, we, we compare two distributions, the conditional distribution of y given x and y given t. Um, so what, what that means is we're asking, do data point x and cluster t we're considering mapping it to say the same thing about the relevance variable y? If they do, the similarity measure between those distributions, the KL divergence, will be small. That exponential will be large, and we're likely to map that data point to that cluster. For if those are very different, if um, the proposed cluster is very, says very different things about y, that KL divergence will be large, the exponential will be small, and we're not going to map that data point to that cluster. Now, uh, note that this fun uh, solution is a function of beta. So it's common practice to visualize the full set of solutions um, using a, a curve um, called an IB curve. So the IB curve plots the relevance term on the y-axis and that compression term on the x-axis. This is a, implicitly a function of beta. So we're sweeping out small beta from the bottom left to large beta at the uh, top right. The curve saturates because at some point we're extracting all the information that x has about y. That's why it saturates at the mutual information between x and y. Um, anything below that curve is feasible. Anything above, infeasible. So that's all we need to know about the information bottleneck. Um, there's lots of nice work on applications and generalizations, but the work I'm going to talk about today is uh, a, a, an extension of this, um, a, an alternative formulation that my colleague and I have been working on. So our jump point for departing from this um, framework is rooted in the choice of compression measure. So in the IB, compression was measured by the mutual information. So um, this metric is, uh, comes from channel coding or rate distortion theory. Um, so the mutual information between X and T is the capacity of the channel, it's the capacity of the channel between them. So this metric encourages the tightening of this channel. It's like a communication restriction. Um, and indeed, the, um, the tightening of this channel is where the name uh, bottleneck and information bottleneck comes from. And you can definitely imagine um, problems that would fit into this framework, but uh, you can also imagine many cases where you don't really care so much about a channel between X and T, but what you want to penalize is the representational capacity of T, something like what you're, the, the number of bits you're storing, the number of clusters. And that is better represented uh, by the entropy of T, which comes from source coding. So this is something, that, once again, it's like the number of bits you'd need to store T. Um, so in the neuroscience example, uh, for example, uh, in a human intention and memory example, um, this would be more closely related to the number of uh, cells you needed um, or number of synapses you needed. Um, so to consider the difference, where, whereas, sorry, whereas mutual information would be more like penalizing the channel from world to sensory system, which is a bit odd. Um, so to understand the difference between these two approaches, we can actually look at the literal difference between these two cost functions. Um, and um, what we get is a negative conditional entropy of T given, sorry, we're calling the first one L sub IB, second one L sub DIB, for reasons that we'll make clear soon. Uh, so we get the negative conditional entropy of T given X, that's also known as the noise entropy. It's a measure of the stochasticity and the mapping from X to T. So since we're, we're minus sign here and we're minimizing, what this means is that L sub IB is implicitly encouraging stochasticity and the mapping from X to T relative to L sub DIB. Um, so what you might expect is this new cost function would lead to a less stochastic encoder, and um, as we'll see in a moment here, it'll lead to a deterministic one, hence the D deterministic IB. So if we try to solve that problem directly, it doesn't work. So what we're going to, what I, what we did is we solved a more general um, family of cost functions, which we then, which the two problems I've just discussed are limits of. So here we generalize to some a uh, family of cost functions parameterized by an alpha. Alpha equals one is just our um, IB case. When alpha is one, that marginal and conditional entropy combine to a mutual information again. The cost function we want to look at is alpha equals zero, but what we're going to do instead is we're going to solve that more general problem, get a solution as a function of alpha, take the limit of that solution as alpha goes to zero, and propose that as the solution to the problem we're interested in. Sort of go through the 
go around the back. Um, so the solution to this more general cost function, you can get just the usual variation of calculus approach. Um, you get those other two equations again that are boring, but I'm leaving them off because uh, they're not important. So we have this uh, we have this equation for the encoder. The proportionality constant just hides the normalization factor, not important. You can see that when we set alpha to one, that log can slide out, and the marginal is just outside now, and we get back to the uh, IB solution that we got earlier, which we should. <clears throat> but the real value of this is that we can take the limit as alpha goes to zero to solve the uh, DIB problem that we're interested in. And when we do that, the, the argument of the exponential blows up. So, uh, but the, the, um, the normalization factor keeps everything normalized, so this converges to a delta function. Um, so what we get is a deterministic solution, hence the D and DIB again, uh, or a hard clustering. So notice that we still have the same KL term we had in the IB solution. Uh, to encourage relevance. We have this log marginal term, which basically um, just encourages mapping data points to clusters that are already large, so a rich get richer kind of scheme. And note that this is an iterative solution, um, just like IB, so I'm only showing the encoder equation here, but we have those two others we need to iterate with, so we start with some initialization, iterate to convergence. <clears throat> so to summarize on one slide uh, this portion, um, we have um, the IB problem, which has uh, the cost functional up there uh, with mutual information as the compression measure, a DIB problem with that replaced by entropy. The uh, IB cost functional yields a stochastic encoder or soft clustering. The DIB cost function uh, yields a hard clustering given by this here. Uh, from an information theory point of view, we might better name these something else like channel coding with relevance and source coding with relevance, but uh, it's a bit too late for that. Um, so that's the, that's the theory, but how do these two methods differ on data? Well, how do we even compare them on data first? Um, so we had that IB plane from earlier that I showed you, map compression measure versus, um, sorry, map relevance measure versus compression measure. We can do the same thing with uh, DIB, same, same relevance measure, but we just change the x-axis to be entropy. In the IB plane, of course, IB will be optimal. In the DIB plane, DIB will be optimal. They're defined that way, but we can still plot solutions um, from both in the same planes and compare them. So we generated a bunch of synthetic uh, joint distributions of X and Y. Here's a typical example. On the left, we have the IB plane. So that's the uh, uh, relevance measure on the Y axis, compression measure on the X axis. Red dots are, uh, sing each dot is a, is, a, is a single fit to a single, to the data set. Uh, and they're sweeping out beta. So red or DIB, greenish, blue, or IB. You can see that things look very similar in the IB plane. Both algorithms extract all the information. They, the, the limit of the y-axis is the mutual information between x and y. So both are extracting all the information. And they're doing so um, at, uh, on the x-axis at the entropy of x, which is, uh, basically means that they, they eventually need to assign each data point to its own cluster to extract all the information. But they perform very similarly there. In the DIB plane, things look very different. We see that the DIB does something very um, expected, just kind of a line up to the, uh, it sweeps, you know, it, it does what you expect. The IB looks very strange. It extracts all the information, but it does so at a very high entropy. Um, and so to understand that, we need to look at the um, <coughs> compression measure that the IB uses. So let's think about um, trying to get uh, maximally compressed, trying to do maximal compression with that compression measure. So the different ways that that could be set to zero. Well, one of them is to set both of these terms identically to zero. So that corresponds to the DIB-like solution, uh, where so entropy is zero. This is like uh, mapping all data points to the same cluster. However, we can also set these, these two entropies equal, but to some uh, non-zero constant. In fact, these could be uh, maximal at lo log cardinality of t. And that corresponds to mapping all data points uh, randomly to different clusters. Both of these are the same level of compression, maximal compression as far as IB is concerned. Um, and uh, so it's agnostic between these two. And it, in, our, in our experiments here, it looks like it's choosing that ladder approach, that random mapping approach. That's why the entropy appears to be so high here. Um, so we thought, well, what if we initialize the IB close to that other solution, where it's mapping all data points to the same cluster, and see if it can figure it out. Um, so these different clusters are just uh, different peakinesses of that initialization. You can see that in the IB plane, nothing changes. Everything looks the same. 
in the DIB plane, um, as you encourage the IB to find those uh, DIB optimal low entropy solutions, it figures it out a little bit, but it never quite, um, it never quite performs as well as DIB. Um, so, um, in summary of, of these plots, uh, I, the, the two algorithms behave similarly in terms of the IB cost function, but um, the DIB performs far better in terms of its own. And this might differ on a different, uh, on other data sets, but at least on what we've tried, it, it seems to be the case. Finally, um, of course, uh, if an algorithm performs better, um, that's not enough. It needs to uh, need be computationally efficient. So um, uh, these, I'm going to skip to the next plot. So uh, these, are, these are the ratio of IB to DIB fit times. Um, you probably can't quite read this, but the key statistics here are like 50% of the time DIB fits um, 10 times faster, uh, and 25% of the time it's 50% faster. Uh, basically, it's about one to two orders of magnitude faster. Uh, again, this may vary by data set, but at least on the data sets we've considered, this is true. Uh, finally, just to summarize quickly, um, we, so we proposed a new cost functional for the extraction of relevant information based on uh, source coding rather than the uh, channel coding approach. As a consequence of that, we got out an algorithm that provided a hard clustering or deterministic encoder rather than a, a, a soft clustering or a stochastic encoder. So it's important to recognize that we, we did not seek out to get a hard clustering. We didn't just say, like, let's do a hard clustering version of this. We made a change to uh, a, an optimization criteria, and that's, a, that's the solution we get out. That's a result. Um, the two algorithms uh, exhibit non-trivial differences and fit the data, especially if you look on the right plane. Um, the algorithm we proposed uh, is, runs faster. Um, and finally, I didn't discuss this uh, during the presentation, but that generalized method that we used to derive the solution to DIB, that had some, uh, that had some parameter which basically allows you to interpolate between the, the soft clustering and hard clustering. So you can actually use that to do sort of things that are in between these two algorithms, in between these two extremes. And that's something we're experimenting with now, but I didn't, I didn't, I didn't throw it in here. I didn't have enough time. Uh, finally, I just want to thank my colleague and my PhD advisor, uh, the Crow Institute for their support over the last few years, and uh, the Hearst Foundation who also funded my PhD.